Uh, I'm Emily Niederst. I'm the scientific director for the Alana Down Syndrome Center at MIT. And I'd like to present to you Leon Sandler, who is the executive director for the Dish Bondé Center. Uh, also at MIT, he, uh, the Dish Bondé Center is running the Technology to Improve Ability program, and he's going to talk to us a little bit more about the program and then introduce our speakers. Thank you, Leon. Just had to unmute my microphone. Okay. So I think I should be good now. Well, uh, welcome everybody. Um, and uh, I'm, as, as uh, Emily mentioned, I run the Deshpande Center for Technological Innovation here at MIT. And the Technology to Improve Ability um, program that we, we run within the center, it's one of our programs, is made possible by the generous support of the Alana Foundation. So the focus um, of our TTIA program is really to try and bring to market technologies that can help people with disabilities um, and improve their lives. And um, with a special focus on people with Down syndrome. So what we do is we fund research at MIT and help the researchers move their technology to a point where it can leave MIT go into an entity that can deliver products that people can use. Because as you know, at a university, we don't produce the products. We want to get these technologies out into the world where they can be useful. Um, and today, we've got some very interesting talks by two of our projects in this program. The speakers will talk for about 15 minutes, um, and then we'll have about 10 minutes of questions and answers. So we'll have a speaker, 10 minutes of Q&A, and then another set of speakers. So to kick the program off, our first speakers are Ravi Rasalingam and Deb Goswami, and they're gonna tell us about their technology for obstructive sleep apnea. So Ravi and Deb. Great, well, thank you very much, Leon, and thank you, Emily, and, and thanks to the Deshwande Center and um, Alana Foundation for this opportunity um, to share with you our project um, we're really excited to do so on behalf of the uh, Roach Lab. So we, our, our goal is to develop a novel device for the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea in people with Down syndrome. So in thinking about that, breathing, we take it for granted. It's something that we do every day and we don't pay any attention to it. But just, for an imagine, just imagine for a moment if you stopped breathing not only once, but multiple times per hour. And the only way that you could start breathing again was through a tremendous effort to overcome an obstruction at the back of your throat. Well, this condition is called obstructive sleep apnea and describes a, a, a disease that really affects the back of the throat where the tongue uh, interfaces with the fleshy part of your palate as shown here in this diagram where the X is. And when these obstructions occur, and these obstructions are called apnea, um, the patient may be unaware of them. It occurs at night and their body tells them that they suddenly have to do a forced expiration to overcome that obstruction and start breathing again. And it happens episodically, multiple times per hour. In some patients, 60 to 70 times per hour. Obviously this disrupts sleep and leads to daytime sleepiness and grogginess. It's incredibly common in the Down syndrome population. 30 to 50% of children with Down syndrome are affected by obstructive sleep apnea. And this increases to 90% by adulthood. It's primarily related to craniofacial abnormalities, the bones of the face being smaller and the tongue already with low muscle tone occupying more space in the mouth, um, predisposing them to obstruction at the back of the throat. Sleep is incredibly important um, and regenerative in this population. And so when sleep is disrupted, this increases the risk of neurocognitive deficits and the strain on the body increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, heart attack and stroke. Um, it does lead to reduced executive functions such as planning and emotional control, problem solving, and reduces that progression to independence. 
The strain also increases the pressures, not only in the heart, but also the, in the lungs, leading to pulmonary hypertension. It is also prevalent in the general population. 17% of men and 9% of women are affected with moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea from the ages of 50 to 70 in the US. And similarly, there are serious ramifications, more than just a poor night's sleep. It does increase their risk of heart attack, stroke, and premature death. Thankfully, there are treatments that are available. Unfortunately, surgical treatments are very rarely curative um, for this disease. So predominant, the predominantly prescribed therapy is non-surgical and is called continuous positive airway pressure. And this is a picture of what that device looks like. It's a large bedside pump that through a wide bore tube that's connected to an airtight, tight fitting mask, forces air continuously through the nose or both the nose and the mouth to try and stent the airway open and prevent those blockages um, from happening. Much less commonly prescribed um, is a oral appliance, which is basically a mechanical mouth guard with a hinge that shifts the jaw forward in a permanent position, dragging the tongue forward and allowing um, the back of the throat to be unobstructed and nasal breathing to occur. As you can imagine, by just looking at these devices, um, they are uncomfortable for the majority of patients. In Down syndrome, only 17% of um, Down syndrome OSA patients um, have a mask that fits and use this device for more than four hours per night. While in the general population, only 60% of OSA patients use these devices as prescribed. So a significant proportion of patients are either untreated or undertreated. Uh, as part of our project, we've been involved with the MIT i program, which is a National Science Foundation initiative to allow researchers to develop human-centered technology based upon customer discovery interviews. And so we've interviewed a large number of the patients affected with obstructive sleep apnea and identified a significant proportion who really do find problems um, with the current technology, especially continuous positive airway pressure. Most of the comments are related to the mask, having it on your face and, and that sensation of claustrophobia or, or even the discomfort of having something so tightly fitting on your face. And also just the restriction of movement and how it affects your, your sleep environment and, and the people around you uh, sleeping next to you. Not being able to be treated for obstructive sleep apnea also just affects your psychological well-being. I think we've all suffered from a poor night's sleep from time to time. And, and just how we feel the next day, just our general mood and our ability to function is affected. So we wanted to create a device that not only prevented these apneic episodes from occurring, but was comfortable enough for somebody to wear in their mouth um, every night um, for a prolonged period of time, something that's, that's necessary to treat a chronic condition. And so what we decided upon was using um, technology, a liner technology that's similar to what is used to shift teeth when they're, they're malaligned. Um, you may have heard of companies such as Invisalign that have really revolutionized this type of uh, treatment. And we use that technology not only just to go over the teeth, but also to extend over the palate. And underneath it, we, through computer design, develop a small suction chamber that when it's connected to a tube, transmits suction towards the tongue, stabilizing it against um, the roof of the mouth. The level of suction is very low. And so if somebody wanted to, they could disengage their tongue at any time. And by stabilizing the position of the tongue against the roof of the mouth, this prevents the tongue from falling backwards and obstructing the back of the throat and allows unobstructed nasal breathing, which is the preferred route for respiration. And thinking about you know, what are the levels of suction that we need to stabilize the tongue, we've tested our device and, and found that the range is somewhere between the sensation of, of sucking on a straw versus um, what, might a, uh, what a dentist might use in their office in terms of suction apparatus. And just thinking about this technology, the reason why we chose an aligner type technology is that these aligners are, are widely available, well-known, um, are used in the mouth uh, for prolonged periods of time and are so 
uh, the, that technology is advanced to such an extent that they're discreet and comfortable. And oftentimes people forget that they're even wearing them once they've gotten used to them. So we wanted that to be the platform that we would use to use our technology, which is introduction of intraoral suction into the mouth. So we wanted to use that as a platform. In order to do so, we invested um, in um, a, a very accurate way to understand the unique anatomy of people. And um, this technology is called digital intraoral scanning. And what it is, is a handheld wand that takes hundreds of high fidelity photos, um, not only of the teeth as in this case, but for our purposes, the palate, which is quite unique. And especially in Down syndrome, the palate anatomy can be quite variable. On the right, you see um, computer designed models um, that are taken from this, uh, this, this photograph that we take on the, on the left side. And uh, just in amongst ourselves, we can, we can see that the, the palette uh, is, is actually quite unique and can change between people quite dramatically. And we wanted to, to build upon that and, and let that inform us when we're developing our platform so that, that a person would have this in their mouth and it would be seamless against their, pa their palette based upon this very accurate way of defining the anatomy. We envision that this would be the future of OSA treatment as compared to the current technology. We want to do away with the tight fitting mask and the monster sized tubing that people really do not want to have um, when thinking about a treatment for this condition uh, that limits their ability to move around in the bed that feels you know, that they are suffocating um, and also that, that, that high pressure constant air that's always being pumped inside to try and you know, keep the airway open and also this, the size and the loudness of the pump. In our technology, we're using, because we're using very low suction pressures, it allows us to use a very fine tube. Um, we don't need a mask to be tight fitting. Um, and we can imagine that, that the suction pump technology um, can be miniaturized to such, a, to such an extent that it could be a wearable that somebody would wear just on their arm, allowing them more free movement in bed. We have come a really long way in our device development over the last two years. Uh, we collaborated with a professional prosthodontist to create our very first prototype, which you now see on the screen. Um, this process involved thermally shaping by hand a formable plastic over a stone cast replica of a volunteer's upper palate. We inserted rubber beads, which are these small red objects that you see, to create a small suction chamber in the design, which can then be connected via a short tube to a small vacuum pump. Since acquiring the high resolution digital intraoral scanning technology that Ravi just referred to, we have been able to make prototypes very comfortable. On the left, you see a low profile custom fit retainer for the upper jaw and palate created by a technique known as thermoforming. The small suction chamber is still manually created and connected to a vacuum pump via tubing. On the right, you see a fully 3D printed upper palate and jaw retainer. I would like to highlight here that the high upper palate arch of this particular device is something that is commonly prevalent in the Down syndrome population. Our 3D printing technique is able to incorporate and reproduce these important intraoral anatomical differences. However, this prototype did not include a suction chamber. Our current and most advanced prototype yet is a fully 3D printed device that is directly made from an FDA approved biocompatible material that has been certified to be safe for overnight use in the mouth. This device also incorporates a monolithic suction chamber with an outlet to connect to a small vacuum pump. You can get a sense of the overall size of the system from the picture on the right. The pump enclosure cuts out any noise, is fully portable and can sit on the person's bedside table. Our current efforts are focused towards further miniaturization as Ravi mentioned, such that it may be pocket sized or even a wearable. In conjunction with prototype development, we are also performing extensive benchtop testing in our laboratory using a setup which can simulate sleep apnea episodes. 
this setup allows us to plug in accurate models of different people's upper jaw and palate and then implement on it our prosthesis. Using this system, we are currently optimizing the design of the suction chamber, holes, pressure levels, and duration of suction. We have performed in-lab comfort testing of our device among volunteers and are currently recruiting participants from within the MIT community for a pilot clinical trial where we will uh, implement our device for a week and have the volunteers give us feedback. Our goal is to extend this clinical trial to the general sleep apnea population by the end of the year and eventually to people with Down syndrome to evaluate the efficacy of our system. Made a tremendous amount of progress in the last couple of years just from identifying a need, um, thinking of a solution, showing, you know, designing and fabricating our first prototype as Deb has just demonstrated and shown you. Um, you know, filing provisional patent and, and testing proof of principle in healthy volunteers. And our, and our goal by the end of this year is to cl show clinical efficacy in, in patients with obstructive sleep apnea. We've had generous support, uh, not only from the Dishbande Center, but um, from the MIT Sandbox Program, VA Innovation Awards, and Tufts um, Clinical Trial Programs. We have invested a lot of time in developing a, a team with the expertise necessary um, for this kind of multi-dimensional project um, that uh, involves material science and engineering aspects in sleep medicine. Here's our team slide. Um, Tasha Ward joins me as an MIT Catalyst Fellow along with Professor Roach in leading the team. Um, we've been blessed with uh, a number of, you know, very talented engineering students and postdoctoral um, fellows, um, collaborators both from sleep medicine and dentistry as well as programmatic advisors from the Dishpande Center, as well as the MIT Catalyst Program. We would really welcome your input and feedback um, and a hope that you know, we could interact with you. We'd love to increase our customer discovery efforts uh, in the Down syndrome um, population, as well as you know, thinking about a future study, um, a clinical study in the Down syndrome population, we would welcome um, some volunteers. And I hope you will join us and getting rid of the mask. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. All right. Um, so I will now, thanks very much, Ravi and Deb. So we've got, if people have questions, please type them into the Q&A and I will just um, select a few uh, that, we can, that we can have them answer. Uh, some of them are pretty straightforward. Um, I have a question about um, whether the information is available in Spanish. And we'll, I'll, I'll, I'm going to defer that one to Emily to figure out, um, you know, afterwards if there's a way of, of doing that. Um, I'm assuming there may be. So we'll, we'll leave that up to her to see if they can um, do a captioning in Spanish. Um, and another question here is, is um, in Down syndrome, how much of the OSA can be contributed to really to mechanical causes versus conditions from neurological or parasympathetic systems. And I'd also add my own thing, and does it make a difference with the treatment? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, not only in Down syndrome, but in the general population, um, the more severe the obstructive sleep apnea, the more likely that there are other contributing factors rather than just the simple obstruction at the back of the throat. Um, in general, however, despite those influences, um, anatomic uh, methods to try and relieve obstruction are still the gold standard of therapy. So, for example, continuous positive airway pressure, which is a mechanical um, device, um, still is effective in, in the majority of Down syndrome patients. Um, not to say that that would completely relieve apnea, but in most cases, we'll leave the, the apnea episodes to close to normal, less than five episodes per hour. 
Great. So um, well, let's uh, grab some things from a couple of questions a few people have asked, which is really around um, the age of, of people who would use the device. You know, one would be what age groups do you think this would be applicable to ultimately once the device is on the market? And then, and then there's this, well, I'll ask that question first. So at the, you know, from the outset, we have, you know, our initial pilot studies are going to be in adults. Um, one of the um, motivations though, in, in thinking about this particular approach is that um, if you think about a child as they're moving from diagnosis to um, dis decision of, about therapy, fabricating that device, and that being implemented in the home, there are a number of different steps there um, that can be quite um, difficult for a child to overcome. One of them is getting an accurate impression of their mouth. Traditional dental um, methods use a kind of a molding technique that's quite cumbersome and takes some time. Digital intraoral scanning has completely revolutionized that and made it very quick and easy for a very accurate impression to be taken. Um, and that really is uh, important in, in providing something that's comfortable and tailored towards that individual and especially a child who is who, who may be less very who may be less tolerant for any um, um, you know uh, features that are uncomfortable or cumbersome and that, that's a really important part of, of the technology that we are trying to develop um, so so we believe that eventually this would be applicable um, for children as well as adults obviously would need to have a much more in, uh, input from 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 caregivers who are you know, looking after those children to, to help implement that technology. Okay, great. Uh, simple question from somebody, if you've got this tube um, you know, at night, uh, is there any risk of strangulation by the suction tube? Somebody rolls around in bed. Yeah, so um, obviously we haven't tested this. Um, we're in the process of testing this, but um, we are guided by CPAP um, you know, devices, which use a tube as well. Um, and the risk of strangulation um, is incredibly low because of the length of tubing that there is, that it, it is proportionate to the size of a bed and the ability for somebody to change position. Um, and similarly, in this case, um, it's, it's a retainer that has a, a spigot on the end of it where the tubing is connected. Um, and there's a, there's a process of tuning that spigot so that it allows enough friction to be in place in, for general movement. But if there was a big tug, it would obviously allow it to be released, the tubing to be released from the prosthesis. Okay, great. Um, and let's see, um, question, this is around the trial, um, which, which you know, I initially you're planning to do uh, in the US. Um, somebody asked from the UK, do you plan to do a trial in the UK or what do you see about, you know, international rollout to beyond the US? Deb, do you want to answer that question? I'm, I'm happy to take that. Yeah, so that's a, that's a very good question. So, um, yeah, as, as you rightly pointed out, so this is a very phased process. So first we are doing this on, on healthy volunteers, meaning people who do not have obstructive sleep apnea. And that is like within our current university environment. Then we want to move to a general population as Ravi mentioned, adults first uh, for reasons related to regulation. And that will be within, within the UK, uh, uh, sorry, within the US. Um, and but however, like we do like have ambitions eventually uh, to perform more global trials once we can establish efficacy uh, within the US population. Great. And here's a question I'd expected very early on. So I'm going to throw this one at you guys, which is how long till it gets to market? And I'll describe my view is when does it get to a point where people can actually get their hands on these devices, you know, buy them? and use them. And this would be your best estimate starting from today and you know how many years? Ravi, do you want to go for it? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. And you know, um, we really bow to the experience of mentors and, and Leon to advise us <laughs> on this because we are you know, very, very much in an early, early phase. Um, we're very excited, obviously, 
but we feel that a real inflection point would be a clinical trial that shows efficacy of our device. I think once we have established that, um, then I think we can really be kind of more firm about the pathway forward for commercialization. And, and so that clinical trial is, is scheduled to start later this year. Um, it will probably take a year, at least, you know, six months to a year to, to get the initial data. Um, and then, you know, we've already filed a, you know, a patent and, and, uh, and, and we believe that we have some ideas about a target market and, and cost for the development of this device and, and what we would eventually, you know, ask you know, for, for it to be reimbursed for. Um, so, you know, as a, as a, as, I don't know if this is being optimistic, but, um, you know, this is more in the kind of like the three to four year range, I would imagine. So not bad. I would have, uh, so from my experience, I will say um, you're looking at three to five years. I don't see this being available in under three years. Um, you know, these are regulated products. The Food and Drug Administration has to, to regulate them. I think it's three to five years, three years if it moves fast, five years if it's a bit slower. And I'd say, you know, it starts in the U.S. and then, you know, reasonably rapidly within a year or so you can expand into international markets because each of those markets will have their own regulator and they'll tell you what you have to do. Um, we're going to move on from now um, and uh, I think go to the next set of speakers, but I want to thank Ravi and Deb. I know there were some questions that weren't answered, but I think we got through most of them. We can, we can take those offline um, and thank you. Thank you very, very much. So um, thank you. Thank you very much. Great. All right. So our next, our second set of speakers um, are Christy Johnson and Jaya Narain, and they're going to tell us about their technology to improve communication. So Christy and Jane, welcome. Jaya, Rotha, Jaya. Christy and Jaya, welcome. Thank you so much, Leon. I'm going to go ahead and play this. Hopefully everybody can see the screen. Um, as Leon just said, I'm Christy Johnson and I'm joined here with Jay and Rain uh, and we are the project leads for Kamala, which is a play on words for communication for all. Uh, we are supported by our advisors, Rosalind Picard and Patty Maas, who are both in the MIT Media Lab. And Kamala is really working towards improved understanding of nonverbal vocalizations from minimally speaking individuals. And this includes up to 18% of the Down syndrome population. The motivation for this project is, in fact, the, the over 1 million people in the United States alone who are non-speaking or minimally speaking. And throughout this talk, we'll refer to that population as MV star. We're happy to go into this, uh, why we call it that in the Q&A, um, but just so you know what we're talking about. Uh, these individuals communicate through many different means. This includes gestures and environmental cues, picture cards, communication devices like iPads, um, and a variety of different sounds that they make, these nonverbal vocalizations. They can include sighs, grunts, yells, even babbles or monosyllabic sounds like hi or boy um, are, are often one of the most organic, accessible and universal communication methods that are used. These express emotions, needs, desires in a variety of different contexts. However, as you can imagine, they can be very difficult to understand for people who don't know the communicator well. Importantly, they are typically well understood by someone who does know the communicator well, which can be a family member or a caregiver, someone who has a lot of experience um, interacting with this communicator. Um, in addition, there exists little to no systematic studies on non or on communicative or affective, meaning emotional vocalizations or emotion based vocalizations from this population. So I'm going to play a sample of vocalizations just to give you a sense of what we're talking about here um, when we say nonverbal vocalizations. Each one of these vocalizations that are played are going to be separated by type. Um, so, for example, the first ones you'll hear are associated with the, the emotional state of delighted, delight, um, kind of excitement or glee. Um, and then there will be a series of emotional states that we'll talk about, as well as interactive states like, like asking for something. Um, you're going to hear a sample vocalization from six different individuals that have been a part of our study. And hopefully you can hear it very well. Let's see if this works. So the first one is delighted. The next sound you're going to hear 
is a, a, a sound associated with a, a state called dysregulated. And this is kind of a general distress state. It's it's typically not associated with a one-to-one a -one, like stimuli response. It might indicate the, the individual is feeling overwhelmed or uh, understimulated. Maybe they're bored or upset, even in pain or sick. Um, but importantly, there is a relatively consistent vocalization that, again, people who know the individual well can identify as being associated with this state. So again, we'll hear it from the six, same six individuals. The next sound is, is frustrated, which is uh, pretty self-explanatory. This is typically a, a more direct mapping from being frustrated about something specific, uh, you know, not getting what you want or, or not being able to communicate clearly can also lead to frustration. This next sound is a, a request sound. So this is a, different than some of the other ones where, you, where they're more about an emotional state. And this is a specific uh, communicative interaction where they're making a request for something. Hmm. Hmm. No. <laughs> And finally, the, the last vocalization type that I'll share is one called self-talk, uh, which is a word that a phrase that we use to describe vocalizations that are often made without a, a clear or overt communicative intent. They often seem to be made to oneself. They're often exploratory or playful in nature and typically associated with being kind of content or relaxed to be able to do that, that vocal exploration. <laughs> and again, there are more vocalizations that these individuals make, but we just wanted to give you a sample of what we mean when we refer to nonverbal vocalizations from this population. So the vision for Kamala was that uh, an MV star communicator could vocalize and this wouldn't necessarily have typical verbal content, meaning words that we are often used to using to understand what's going on. Um, and so we might capture an audio segment of this vocalization in real time, in the, in the wild, in their home, when, when the communication occurs. It could be processed using machine learning on the back end. And then uh, the suggestion of what that vocalization was referring to could be sent to the communication partner. And importantly, these are, again, the people who don't know the individual very well. Um, so we're trying to bridge that communication gap that's occurring. Um, so this might be sent to the communication partner. And ideally, in, in, our, in our vision world, uh, a suggestion is also sent to the, back to the MV star communicator to enhance the communication modalities that they already use. So this might include things like um, alternative and augmentative communication devices. Um, and it could say like, oh, we recognize that what the sound that you just made was associated with being hungry or being frustrated. Let me help you, uh, the prompt you to, to expand on that communication. And what we're really hoping to do is expand this communication feedback loop so that the individual recognizes that they are being understood and has the agency to communicate more as well as the communication partner is acknowledging the communication as as an interaction and responding in kind. So to do this, we had to develop a scalable data collection platform that could be done in individuals' homes, uh, in their daily lives and routines, and uses in the moment labeling. So what we did for these original studies was use a wearable recorder that was attached to clothing or, or placed nearby. Um, it was attached using magnets, so it could be put on kind of any location that was comfortable. And it was really easy to uh, integrate with daily activities um, to minimize the stress or um, complications associated with um, going to a lab or using a bulky equipment. And importantly, these individuals often communicate uh, these vocalizations most robustly and most clearly, you know, most well understood in their own environment. They need these uh, different cues and, and structures that are that exist in their home or in their um, uh, backyard, uh, the play playground, school um, to really make sure that we're confident in how we're, we're being in, um, interpreting them. Then at the same time, a, we built a custom app that caregivers or parents or family members, again, this didn't have to be a family member, but for our study, most of them were either family members or caregivers of these individuals, someone who knows them very well, to label 
the um, interpretation of the vocalization in real time. So these have the different states that I was referring to before. Um, self-talk, dysregulated, delighted, request, frustrated. Um, and those were shared across all of the individuals in our study. In addition, there were four customizable labels that could be used um, by the family members um, and the participants to uh, customize the app so that we were capturing the vocalizations that were really meaningful and also difficult to understand for that family. So those were customizable for each participant. And um, the data set that we're presenting here involves eight participants uh, that uh, range from both genders and ages from six to 23. We did not exclude on the basis of age or gender just to make sure that we were capturing a broad population. These individuals in, um, had diagnoses of autism spectrum disorder, Down syndrome, other genetic disorders, as well as cerebral palsy. Um, and they spent a varying amount of time in the study based on their availability and, and um, availability to participate from four weeks to over a year. Um, and these individuals, importantly, had zero word or word approximations, that is no spoken word or word approximations, up to a, a handful, maybe eight. We were able to capture over 7,000 vocalizations from this population, and that um, is the largest database of nonverbal uh, vocalizations with communicative and affective labels from MV star individuals. So what you're seeing on the left here involves all of the different um, labels that were used by the participants on on the bottom axis, you see the different participants. And each number represents one vocalization, like what you heard at the beginning for that was labeled with that state. This created, like I said, over 7,000 vocalizations across these participants collected over many months. It is one of the first uh, data sets that was collected uh, using naturalistic data and data day life. It is the largest data set of nonverbal vocalizations. And importantly, we're releasing this publicly. It'll come out this summer. And now, so one of the things that we've been focusing on is developing this technology towards the type of interface that Christy described earlier for communication. So to do that, we've been doing an analysis on building machine learning models to classify these vocalizations using the labels. So the approach we've taken has really focused on personalized multi-class classification models, which is suitable for this type of small, messy data set with a heterogeneous population. The labels that were marked by for our study, the close family member are used as the ground truth for the vocalization. And then different features are extracted that describes the acoustics of the vocalization sample and used to train a model, which can then predict for each participant whether the vocalization was delighted or dysregulated or self-talk, something else. So we have trained these personalized models for each of the eight participants. And the modeling results are shown here. Here I'm showing the F1 score, which is a combination of both the precision and recall of the model. And what's exciting here is that all of these model performances for each participant is above chance, which is 0.2 for a five-way classification or 0.25 for a four-way classification. We selected the labels for the models based on which classes had enough training samples, um, so at least 30 samples per class. And this is exciting because when we began this project, we didn't know if these vocalizations could be classified just based on the acoustics alone. And so for all of these eight participants, we've been able to do that. Um, and we're currently expanding on these modeling approaches and hoping to get these results even higher as we move forward. Um, there are a lot of variations from participant to participant um, and that some of those are due to differences in how the families collected data, how they labeled data, um, because it was a real world data set, there's varying audio quality, um, which we did on purpose because we wanted to, you know, make sure from the onset that these models would be transferable to the real world, but that doesn't mean the model has to fight background noise and things like that. Um, and there are also maybe some inherent differences in how vocalizers are communicating. So here we wanted to emphasize that we have really been undertaking a participatory design and data collection process from the beginning. So we began this work with doing a number of interviews, an extended survey, as well as a literature review towards identifying this concept where we feel there's, we, be, we feel from what we've been told from families that there's a lot of room for helping people who don't know the communicator as well better understand how they're communicating. And then we undertook an eight month long case study with one communicator where we tested a lot of things in homes with many different people involved in parks and outside environments. And now we're slowly been scaling up the data collection and usability testing with the small end you saw of eight participants. 
And we now have a prototype for an app that is towards the vision that Christy described earlier for communication technology. And this app also now allows users to label and record data directly in the app themselves, has a prototype classification feature, a sample sound library, and some other features. So we have some videos here to demo how the app works. So the user would press and hold a label to record a sound, and then they can look and listen to all the sounds that they've recorded on the app and delete any that they don't want to share. Um, in the classification feature, you can press and hold that microphone to record a sound, and then the model shows its results to you. In this case, frustrated, the user can upvote or downvote the label to provide feedback on how the model is doing. And if they downvote a label, they can also provide feedback as to what the correct label should have been. There is also a sample sound interface where families can listen to the data that they've recorded. Um, they organized by category. And the idea behind here is that we hope that having this data in a nice fashion that's easy to listen to could help families share what these vocalizations sound like when they do have a new babysitter or a grandparent is visiting. Um, people can listen to these and start to understand what to listen for in interactions. And the app also includes some tracking for families collecting data to keep track of how many of each label they have collected. Um, this is still very much a prototype, so there's still a lot of work to do in evaluating the model performance and usability in particular. Um, and right now we are managing a lot of things on the back end with respect to model training and the data management for each individual user, because it's all personalized for each user. So in the future, we hope that one, the data we've collected will help create better knowledge on the speech and language developmental profiles of individuals in this population um, towards developing these communication interfaces that would really be enabled by expanded data collection with more communicators, as well as some additional features in the app development itself. And we also hope to do user testing expanded with people with very diverse communication profiles. Um, so we wanted to thank well, firstly, all the participants involved in this study, um, our collaborators, and also, of course, the Ishpande Center and the TTIA program for funding this work, um, as well as had support from other avenues as well. So thank you to everyone for their support. Thank you to all of you for listening, and we'd be happy to take any questions now. Okay, let's see. Great. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks very much, Christy and Jay. Um, so now if you have questions for them, um, if you would type them into the Q&A and we will take some, I'll just wait a few seconds so people um, put in any questions that they may have. And we'll see. Okay. So I'm looking at the questions. Um, some of them look like they are more um, sort of statements than questions, um, like somebody would love to find a resource like that. Um, but, uh, you know, there was a question, I'll paraphrase it, is that sometimes somebody cannot speak, but they can write. Um, and do you think that would be applicable to them? Um, so probably not exactly as we've described here, because it is um, the labels we used in this study were pretty broad. So if somebody could write, um, it may not be as useful for them. But we do see as future work kind of having allowing people to make those labels more specific, um, so that if somebody wanted to make sound shortcuts to express specific things, or you know control their phone, or parse an AC device. Um, and I think that could be possible with future testing. And I think something like that, you know, as a next step would be more useful for expanded populations, people who, who do already, right? Okay, so he has a question that I know you, um, whoops, if I could, you will you'll have, you'll have some input on. And that is, um, if you look at a nonverbal vocalization from an individual, um, within just looking within that individual are those 
invariant over time or do they change over time so they need retraining? So this is not across individuals, but within the same individual. Yeah, it's, it's a really great question, uh, which first of all, there because there's no uh, data on vocalization or just speech or language development for this population at all. Uh, this is the first time we've been able to look at that. Um, and we have seen evolution of vocalization uh, types and uses, kind of the, the maybe the breadth, maybe the, a type of vocalization that wasn't used in the past is now being used. Um, so it does evolve over time. However, there is some inherent uh, consistency that we have seen within uh, individuals that allow us, to, you know, we, we see this in the machine learning models where we're able to um, differentiate between the different types as well as just kind of lower level analysis of these different sounds that there is consistency across the individual in the way that they might make a sound. For example, they might make a lot of um, uh, kind of consonant vowel pairs in, in self-talk like m -m 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 or something like that, uh, whereas in frustrated it's a lot of open vowels like ah! and these uh, kind of broader uh, delineations of types seem to be relatively consistent. But what's exciting is that we can map the evolution uh, or that, you know, we can possibly start to map the evolution of the um, this language in a population that has been completely overlooked by um, uh, the, the fields in, in the past of the these data don't exist, so. Okay, so let me try and, um, let me try and interpret this one. Um, hmm. Not quite sure what, what um, the person means, but maybe they'll send another question. But this is around, they're curious if you've done any work on using the model you train to help interpret the communications vocalizations as well. So enhancing speak re speech recognition for these individuals. I don't know if that means anything to you, Christy or Jay. Yeah, so I'm gonna inter interpret this as asking about um, speech recognition for individuals who have verbal speech that might be altered and more difficult to understand by like a traditional speech recognition system like Siri. Um, and that is a great concept that we would love to explore. We haven't been able to do that yet. Our focus has been on individuals as you saw, have fewer than 10 spoken words or word approximations. So that wasn't as relevant here. But I think one of the things that would be a really nice you know, future work or follow up would be expanding who this could be useful for and allowing people to, um, to train it for direct speech recognition and improve those models. Okay, great. So that's probably where the person who's doing the speech can actually train, train the model. Um, the other question is, you know, in, in the data that you collected, um, do you try and see reliability in labeling by the family of similar utterances by their child? Yeah, we, yeah. go ahead, Jay. Go, go, go for it. <laughs> uh, we, we do look at um, how these labels differ. Um, some of this has been in terms of uh, how we set up the study. We've learned a lot and what uh, the ways we need to kind of uh, explain how the labels are made in real time and, and definitely the new app that we just presented that we're starting to uh, uh, user test uh, will help uh, with kind of a better one-to-one -one mapping between the way the vocalizations are made and um, and how they're labeled. Um, but I would say, relatively speaking, we have seen broad consistency in how they're labeled. We ask at the beginning, right? We don't go in and just say, label, label whatever you think. We kind of um, work with them to work with each participating family to determine like, do they have this type of vocalization? Can you describe it? Do you know what it is in, in your head? And then here's how we're asking you to label it in real time. And then here's how we're parsing it on the back end. So um, I would say there is broad uh, reliability, but there's definitely room for improvement in, in terms of both the technology end and um, the, the interaction end um, on communicators. Okay, so here's one from um, a retired engineer and spe speech pathologist. You probably have to be very precise in your answer here. Um, and he has a son with Down syndrome and ALL, so I'm not sure what the DSALL, with minimal speech. And he asks, can he expect to see an app he could use to catalog his speech? That's a great question. So the app that we showed was a prototype, particularly the classification features are very much a prototype. Um, for cataloging speech, actually, um, if you are interested, and we'd be happy to have this conversation offline, but if you're interested in the labels we showed here, um, the cataloging aspect of it is you know, pretty ready to go. So we'd be happy to give you a 
pilot version of the app if you wanted to try it out. Yeah, I would I would jump on that and also add there was somebody else who asked about using it for the family member. If people are interested, please do contact us. We are still enrolling um, and, um, and interested in continuing to uh, prototype with interested families. So um, connect to us. I don't know if you can share our email, Leon or, or Emily. Um, it's, it's yep, and it's pretty easy to find because MIT everybody is sort of public, but we can definitely um, do that. So, yeah, yeah. You, can, you can contact us at kamala at mit.edu, and that will go to to both Jay and myself. There you go. I'll so put Kamala. it in the chat. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. So if you want to put that in the chat, that's excellent. Um, then people will be able to see it in the chat. Um, but kamala at mit.edu. Okay, and that's two L's in Kamala, C-O-M-A-L-L-A. -L -L -A. Like communication for all. Yeah, okay, great. Um, I think that's, boy, good timing. I think that's all the questions and it's perfect timing because we're going to have to close them off right now. Uh, so I'd like, to, I'd like to thank all of our speakers today, uh, Jaya and Christy and Ravi and Deb, and, and thank the audience um, for attending. I hope you found this interesting. You can see all this very exciting work we're doing to really try and um, improve people's lives. And, um, you know, I would ask you to have some patience. It does take time for these products to get out into the world. It's, it's more years than months, but, um, you know, please stay in touch and, and um, and definitely, you know, follow up with what's going on here. And I'm now going to turn this back to, to Emily for some closing words. Uh, thank you, every, everyone, for coming um, and attending. And we hope that you find the stuff we're working really exciting. Uh, in terms of um, this presentation, we have recorded it and we will put it on YouTube in a YouTube link that we will send to registrants. So if you're re you know, if you registered to watch this, then we'll email it out. We will also put the contact information that the speak if you know the speakers want us to share um, in that email also. So for example, if you didn't get the email address for Christine and Jaya's project, um, it'll come to you from the registration link. Uh, we also will have all of this information and the videos um, on the Alana Down Syndrome website. Uh, so if you, if you can Google Alana Down Syndrome Center, that is, um, it's Alana at alana.mit.edu. We all will have the videos and we have contact information, including my information, so I can refer anyone to um, these groups if you need it. Um, and finally, we have a plan, somebody asked earlier about translation. Uh, we we we're, we will have it for sure closed captioned so that anyone that's not hearing can can read. Uh, right now we have someone that will be assisting us with translating it into Portuguese, but at the moment we don't have assistance for translating into other languages. Um, if we get that, we will add them. Um, so right now we will have it in English and Portuguese and captioned uh, on the YouTube link that we send to registrants and on the Alana website. So again, thank you for everyone for coming. We hope you find our, our things exciting and we hope you have a, a safe and healthy rest of your day.